students. Today I want to talk about uh, what species are not, and in particular I'm talking about named species. Like I'm not talking about those theoretical things that we talk about in evolutionary biology. Species vary in how distinctive they are as compared to their nearest relatives, and let me try to illustrate this. We'll start with this phylogeny that I had something to do with figuring out. And let's just look at the tips of the phylogeny at things that appear to be sister species. So at the top there, we have Kekiella ternata and Kekiella breviflora. And what I want to do is take a whole series of these species pairs that appear to be sister species. And I'll rotate it 90 degrees so it looks kind of like that. That's a species pair. And then I'm going to specify that we know some things about these species. So the top of the triangle there is the amount of variation that occurs within the species, and the distance between the two triangles is the amount of eco-morphological change that's occurred in the divergence of the two species. The height of the triangle is the time to coalescence of the lineages, so some species will have coalesced uh, relatively recently, and then other species will be widespread and they will have coalesced uh, in the more distant past. And then, of course, we can also have the time to the common ancestor of the species. So what I want to do is just consider a whole bunch of these things. And here's 30 pairs. And I've arranged the 30 pairs from the bottom left being the two species that have diverged the most up into the top right, the two species that have diverged the least from one another. And what I'm asserting is that if we took a sample like this of 30 species, we would find all little gradations of the amount of distinctiveness between the two closely related species. There's no cutoff line where you can say that something below that is just a distinctive subspecies and something above that is a distinctive species. Now you'll notice that some of these have the species diverging above the point of coalescence. Those are progenitor derivative species pairs where you had one species, usually a widespread one, that lived probably in one niche, and then it gave rise to a new species that's distinctive, and that arose just out of part of its range. So, for instance, the big cone Douglas fir that we see here is a narrow endemic, and we think that it probably arose from uh, within the widespread regular Douglas fir, and that widespread regular Douglas fir would be a progenitor species, and the big cone Doug fir would be the derivative species. We can look at this a little more carefully, and you can see that the progenitor species need not have coalesced into being reciprocally monophyletic with the derivative species. So you could have the case where the derivative species closest relative is just part of the progenitor species, and the progenitor species uh, has other lineages that are not really morphologically and ecologically differentiated from one another, but have also not been interbreeding recently with uh, the part that gave rise the, to the derivative species. So I would say at this point that species vary in how different they are from their closest relatives, and how much variation they encompass, and in how old they are. See, we have some of those lineages that go way, way back, even if they're very close together, and then other lineages that are very different from one another that are relatively recent. Moreover, uh, they do not have to be whole and complete twigs on the tree of life. They don't have to be each monophyletic. What this means is that the rank of species differs from the rank of variety below it only as a matter of degree. This is something that Darwin asserted. You could also say the same thing about the rank above it. The rank of species also differs from the rank of subsection above it only as a matter of degree. Moreover, the vagueness of the species rank, it shifts from group to group. 
So an expert on mosses would have a certain way that they applied their uh, species rank. And then an expert on birds might have a different way that they applied their expertise as regards the species rank. And salamanders would be different than mammals and so on. Also, species are not necessarily formed just by divergence. They can be formed through hybridization. So here we have a purple species that arose through hybridization of two species that are not even sister species. And then here's the other species just carried through. And then one of the parental species can be extinct. And in some cases, the hybridization is asymmetric before it stabilizes. So there's an F1 hybrid, but then it back crosses to one of the parents and that eventually stabilizes into a new species, but it's not it's one that both parents equally contributed to. Hybridization does not necessarily lead to new species. It can just lead to a trickle of gene flow between established species that continue on. And species vary in how capable they are of interbreeding with other such species even very distinctive ones. So if we go back to the things that I study, these are penstemons, and the one on the top is Penstemon davidsonii. It's purple. It lives at high elevation. The one on the bottom is Penstemon newberii. It's magenta. It lives uh, at low elevation. And at intermediate elevations, these two species freely hybridize. But that hybridization is restricted to just a narrow band of elevation and the genes presumably can leak into these two opposite species, but somehow or other natural selection keeps them in their niches. So in the case of Pensamon davidsonii and newberii, we can diagram it like this, and what results is a secondary cline, not a new species. On this diagram, I have color running from high elevation to low elevation, I also have how the border around the circle changes from high elevation to low elevation. And those two characters change concordantly together. And they also are a step cline that uh, changes at this intermediate elevation. Complex species like humans can also display primary clines, not just secondary clines. And here could be a primary cline for some species complex where you have the red uh, and purple going from north to south. And you also have the border, whether it has a border or not, going from north to south. But the two clines don't have to correspond to one another. You can have characters that are not concordant in primary clines. And so here I have color going north to south, but I have the border going east to west, where the ones on the west have a thick border and the ones on the east have no border. And there's no place along the line where you could draw it. You couldn't separate this out into two species because it's just a, a gradual climb, and it contains a lot of variation. Some species are like this, others are not. You also have some species that display mosaic variations where you get little patches of one character or another character. This might be the case where, for instance, there's patches of a soil that's very toxic. And so the background soil is fine and everything is adapted to that. But then when they get on the, when the plants get on the toxic soil, they tend to adapt to it. And uh, so they're a little bit different on the toxic soil. And that forms a geographic mosaic. So to recap here, species vary in how different they are from their closest relatives. They vary in how much variation they encompass. And that variation may be clinal or it may not be clinal. Species vary in how old they are. I might also say that species vary in how broad their geographic ranges are, whether they have narrow geographic ranges or broad geographic ranges. Species do not have to be reciprocally monophyletic with their nearest relatives. 
They may have formed through divergence alone, or they may have formed through hybridization, uh, or some combination of the two. Almost any kind of characters can distinguish closely related species, like being adapted to different habitats, or having different blooming seasons, or having pollen tubes and styles that are incompatible. I've listed some things that are biologically important there, but you can also have species that differ in trivial ways. And those trivial ways might be genetically linked to something that's biologically important, but you don't know what it is, or who knows. You know, like species differ in all sorts of different ways, and it's very hard to know why that's the case. Furthermore, species do not have to be completely unable to hybridize. There's lots and lots of cases where we have species that uh, hybridize, but they're very distinctive and they're good species to taxonomists. We also have lots of cases where we have a single species, a single name species, and it contains uh, multiple lineages that are ancient and that haven't hybridized for a long time and presumably can't hybridize anymore, but we don't split it into different species because they all look the same and they fill the same niche and we don't know what to do with them because you'd have to look at them in terms of the molecules that indicate the history of their separation, not in terms of something that you can see. So taxonomists do their best to name species that are useful, uh, but as units of nature, the rank of species is kind of at best a subjective, continuous assessment forced to be categorical. That is, it's fundamentally continuous, and it's subjective, and it's weighted in all sorts of crazy ways, and then taxonomists just force it to be categorical because they're trying to pigeonhole it into the system that we have. So is anything about taxa real? I would say yes. Although the ranks are imposed by taxonomists, the groupings reflect reality in many cases. It's just that those groupings are of different sizes and distinctivenesses. The species Homo sapiens is real, even though it has more clinal geographic variation and a much longer stem than the species of bonobos. The species of bonobos is also real, although it could be treated as a subspecies along with the common chimpanzee. And whether you treat it as a subspecies or a species is just a matter of judgment. In general, the lineages and their hierarchy are real things to be discovered and described, and the rankings, whether you treat things as different subspecies or different species, or you put them in different subsections, is construed to give others a very rough sense of the level of distinctiveness. So in other words, species can be real in more or less the same way that genera and families are real, and they are also more or less unreal in the same way that genera and families are unreal. And that's all I have to say about that.